Hi everyone, welcome. Uh, this is Sonali. Thank you all for carving out some time for attending today's webinar on the part one of the BX Learning Series, Invest, Scale and Value. To all the attendees out there, please type in any questions you might have in the Q&A section and we'll try to answer as many as possible at the end of the session. I would now like to introduce our speaker. As the chairman of the Franchise India Group, he is widely ad admired for his non-conformist operating style, direct and to-the-point advice, and vigorous marketing tactics and strategy. He sits on the boards of several organizations and has been retained by several private equity funds. He has chaired several global, sp uh, global business forums on franchising and retail in India, US, Australia, Russia, Paris, and London. In the spirit of sharing his thoughts, he has authored three best-selling titles on subjects dear to his heart and central to his business. These include Franchising, The Science of Reproducing Success, Take Charge, Building an Entrepreneur Mindset, and It, and it Takes Two to Tango, Achieving Customer Connect in Shape-Shifting India. Recognizing that more and more people in India are investing into active businesses and taking on the entrepreneurial path, he wants to serve this community better as a growth specialist helping entrepreneurs through knowledge and service on all aspects of buying, setting up and growing a business. With that being said, I would now like to welcome Mr. Gaurav Mada. Thank you, Sonali. Uh, good afternoon, friends, and welcome to, as Sonali said, the first uh, series of, uh, uh, you know, this, we, we call it investing series. And this would be about three different topics which we will bring every week. Uh, one is on investments, and uh, which is today. Uh, we will talk about how you should look at investments and, and different asset classes and so on and so forth. So week on week, we will go on and talk about different assets and, and where you should look after and, and what kind of a, you know, do's and don'ts are for the investment. Second is a series going to be on scaling the businesses and, and how you scale your investments. And third is how do you build value? So between investment, uh, scaling up and building value, we'll divide this series and, and every week we'll have one topic been done. So today is all about investment. And, uh, you know, I'll give you uh, pieces of learnings which have come from a lot of knowledge base which we have, we have gathered over the years. And also some of my own learnings on, on investment. So we will do that. And if you have any questions in the, in the meantime, uh, you can continue to ask uh, in your q a box so let's set some perspective first on investment and try to uh, uh, set some foundation uh, what kind of investors we see around you know are uh, you know in the in the space we, we see two types of investors one are what we call active and passive and this is what we discussed to me first starting point is there's nothing like passive it's all active you know, you are actively investing in, but you can be an operator and non-operator. That should be the difference, you know, so it should not be that whenever you're looking to invest, you should never think like that. You, there is something like what we call a passive investment. There's nothing like a passive investment it should be always active investments. And, uh, and this only difference you can have in investments is that are you operating that investment or somebody else is operating for you. So, <clears throat> and I've divided this uh, investors into further three parts you know, and what we call the three F's of uh, being investors. First is with, which we call the firm investors. And these firm investors are, are normally people who are well-researched and they're very asset focused. So they would not do any other thing. They were very, very researched. They're deep coming from that domain. They understand that domain very well and they very clearly uh, go after that particular asset. So I've seen uh, people have years and years, decades and decades invested only in equity. They would only invest in equity. There are people who invest into property. They would just invest into property. That's where their money is going to be. They were well, well researched uh, people. If you give them other options, uh, they would not go uh, through that because they know how to make money in that particular thing. They're firm investors, they call it. Second are more flexible investors. And these, this asset class is growing, especially professionals are like that. They always... Uh, try to diversify their risk. Uh, they try to diversify their investment class. They will put some money in the financial investment. They put some money in property and some other asset classes also. Uh, these are more uh, flexible. But the third one, which I am seeing these days, uh, a lot of them, which were, are what I call the freestyle investors. These freestyles are very impulsive, very high risk takers. They are normally first movers and sometimes they make a lot of wealth. 
just because of their first mover advantage. So, so we, we between these three kind of uh, investors, we'll find we one will find very firm, second are flexible, and third are very freestyle uh, investors. So there is a very uh, the entire discussion I will do today. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> And we will start with the first part, which means anytime you're looking to invest, what we should look at. So I will start with a quote from uh, the greatest uh, you know, author in the, in the investment space, uh, Benjamin. And he wrote that the investment is a knowledge which pays the best interest. The knowledge investment in knowledge pays the best interest. When it comes to investing, nothing will pay off more than educating yourself. So fundamental of any investment is that unless and until you are educating regularly yourself on on wherever asset class you're investing on or a particular business you're investing on, that would pay. So first a part to the discussion today is how do you really, uh, before you even start investing, how do you really decide where you want to go, what kind of investment you want to do? And that starts with what we call your life and your financial goals. You know, sometimes people make financial goals, which is good to make, but your life goals will not marry with it. So unless and until you marry your life goals and your financial goals together, then only the real results would come. So uh, well, how do you do that? I mean, I, I feel that one of the things I, have, I really follow uh, is what I call smart goals. And smart goals are very specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and timely. So how do you design your smart goals? How do you design your structure? But let's before that, we need to ask a lot of questions to ourselves uh, before you even make a choice of investment what stage you are in your life, you know, and I've seen my thinking myself, I started my business at age of about 20, uh, started making money. I don't know how much was that business, uh, but I was started making money if that was to be called a business. Uh, and, uh, and my thinking was very different at that time. Uh, and in thirties were very, very different. Now in late forties is a uh, very different. And I'm sure it would change even five years from now, my thinking would change. So you need to really first ask yourself what stage you are in your life and how this uh, next 10 years of your life goals and your financial goals are going to marry. What is there going to be? So if you only do life goals or if you do only financial goals, it doesn't work. It has to marry with each other. What is your requirement? What is your life requirement? What do you see? What's happening? Your, what are the critical things coming in next five years, 10 years with you? And how are you going to balance that? What is your cash flow requirement next 10 years and make that each? So this will be your cash flow uh, where you need cash, which are the big movements that will come in and when they are expected to come in and where you would need cash. Say if you have a say at a particular stage, you have somebody to get married and you need maybe two crores at that time, and where is that liquidity going to come from? And uh, and at that stage. What, what are you going to see and how your exits would come from your investments and so on and so forth. Uh, what is the meaning of wealth creation for you? You know, what is a lot of people talk about wealth creation, but they cannot put a dot to it. They don't know what is the real wealth. What is the number? Like, uh, it's very difficult at times for investors to even put a number to it. You know why we, we, we talk about it, but we don't have a definite number. To, first, you need to really start with putting that number in your mind. And that's where you should be uh, following that. What is a save, saving, a current savings you have and current liabilities you have and how it is balanced uh, between these two. Any investment you currently have and will continue to take your attention or need further investments. You know, one of the areas which I've found is that when you start investing fresh into something, uh, you forget about what we already invested on. And they also have a lot of requirements, both in terms of your time and in, in terms of the future investments. So unless and until you evaluate where you are at this stage currently, uh, then you make a decision for making a new investment. First, evaluate deep down your current investments and what kind of a commitment these investments are asking for. What is your fallback capital? Which means that if the business for reasons doesn't do well or the investment which you have invested and not done well, or it is not giving you adequate exit. You know, sometimes you're parked in an investment and like these days, what is happening with property, a lot of people have made uh, investments in land banks and things like that, and uh, they are not able to liquidate. So that they are asset rich, cash poor. Uh, and uh, so sometimes in their other businesses, when they have urgency, they need to get the money back. They are not able to do that. And I have seen a lot of industrialists, a lot of business houses failing miserably because they were always asset rich, but the asset was not able to liquidate at a the time they needed. 
So their businesses became, uh, you know, uh, they dried, they needed the cash flows, they needed more money, that money was not able to come because all that money they took out and parked into a uh, lot of land bank assets and so on and so forth. So where is your fallback capital, your savings, and have you measured that? And especially for a lot of these uh, startups, professionals, they take a very big risk when they start investing, right? So they put all their savings. And sometimes they come out of that uh, professional life and, and start. And like uh, startups, a lot of colleges, uh, uh, you know, students come out of directly from college and start an enterprise for reasons that doesn't do it. What is their fallback plan? What, where are they going to go? Can they go back to their careers and start the careers back? Would their job opportunity would be available at that time? Or not available that all has to be calculated and so you need to really know that what is your fallback capital or fallback plan which is available in you what you will bring in the investment outside your capital and the second most uh, contribution thing you will bring to it. i'll explain that what happens you know always we try to whenever we try to do business so we only think about what kind of capital we want to deploy i think capital you keep it on the side ask yourself what is the second most important thing you bring it to that asset or to that business uh, sometimes it is your skill it is sometimes your experience in that industry or whatever it is what is the second most important thing which you will bring apart from the capital in your investment and that term sometimes is the biggest driver uh, for this for example me at uh, my uh, level i mean i always felt that i was best at broking or uh, deal structuring or business advisory that was my strong skill so anything i have done in is around it i have always been very successful my investments have been successful but a lot of times i have invested same capital into businesses which didn't marry with my skill and that was not so successful so it is very important that you find out which is the second most important thing you are bringing after the capital uh, into your investment it can be your time somebody people bring in absolute uh, 365 days time sometimes you bring in a lot of knowledge base and capability your understanding your so whatever skill set you have or whatever uh, the second most important thing you have you need to uh, bring that <clears throat> now we go down to uh, so how do you marry your how you manage your financial goals how you define your financial goals it's also very important because it's a very unending process you know what i call how do you keep the balance between competing and conflicting priorities you know so try to understand again you know you have a lot of competing priorities which will come to the same investment you're doing and also come some conflicting how do you create a balance between these two and also uh, uh, how do you balance between what i call the income generation and are building a long term value uh, so sometimes income is your monthly cash flows and your returns which are coming in which would pay your bills and you continue to do that sometimes we get too focused on that we don't know where is the real answer for a long term value being created and also dividing your financial structure into uh, short term goals uh, short term goals uh, would mean that how your you know current requirements which would be service fund and mid time goals mid time goals also are very important that how do you invest and sometimes uh, uh, in a short term mid time you also look at some kind of exit and then uh, reinvest into uh, some other assets or whatever uh, business you want to do and a long term i think uh, uh, one should have a strategy with, which is what is 5 to 10 year cycle uh, what is the investments you are doing it in the same investment you can portion out it all you can also look at uh, short term cycles you can also look at a mid term cycles and there should be always a plan for a for a long term structure now let's talk about how do you really balance between what i call uh, three things you know what is called saving cash flow and future investment now this i will explain you a little more in detail and this i have passed through my own experiences uh, sometimes when you start early and i have seen this in startups uh, they any money comes in they quickly want to buy a lot of things you know they want to buy their it goes into their savings you know they want to want to buy their apartment they want to buy this and so they sometimes eat into their cash flows also uh, and uh, they the companies don't survive or companies start uh, passing through a uh, uh, cash flow problems so so you need to really divide any kind of investment you do very clearly what portion you will give it to your savings what portion you will give it to continue to have your cash flows being healthy 
And third, which is equally important, is that what kind of money you will park on the side to recapitalize your business or to bring future investments. I have seen a very successful entrepreneurs, business owners who do the first two right, because first two are always in their control and they are able to do that. They balance between their savings and cash flows, but they are never having enough capital to look at the opportunity when it comes. So a lot of times you miss opportunities because you never have the kind of capital being earmarked for you to look at opportunities coming from outside. And you see currently, uh, which I admire with a company like Reliance, look what he's trying to do. At this stage, he's trying to unlock his equity, bring the company back in the terms of his building his chest. On one side, he's writing off his debt uh, because he doesn't want the cost of capital going and he's making the company more healthier. On other side, we are hearing a news that he might be on the acquisition side. So this guy is a multiplier. You know what he's trying to on one side, trying to uh, you know this, uh, make the company's health good because he's taken entire cost of capital out. Uh, there is no debt available on Reliance now. On one side, he's actively unlocking so that he can bring a lot of reserves back because he knows there is a buy time coming, and a buy time he needs to pull up his chest up so that he will have a lot of opportunities which would come underpriced at this stage where he can do that. And now he's in market and also actively looking at acquisition. So now you'll see uh, from this time to maybe next year, Reliance would be up there for a lot of acquisition because he's built his chest up. And the company is healthy, he's no load, he has no debt sitting there, so he can survive. So, <clears throat> so this is a very interesting uh, time structure. So how do you really put your savings how do you put your cash flows and how do you continue to build your chest up wherever the opportunities keep coming in, you can put that uh, structure. So this is something which is very important. And, and finally, you have to really place your this financial goal into uh, what I call three, three groups. One is what I call alignment. How is it aligned with your, your life goals? How it is aligned with your growth? Uh, very important. You need to really see is this year on year growth for next 10 years or 15 years or 20 years and what is your exposure how much you are exposing yourself you know and if you are able to balance between these three things alignment with your life goals uh, growth cycles uh, which you can really clearly define and run and third is uh, exposure now coming down to the second part so first we really discussed on on uh, you know what what should be uh, the, the structure in terms of your life and financial goals. Now we will talk about how to research an asset uh, because from next uh, uh, episode, we will talk about a particular asset and we'll go deep down into that. But I'll give you now some tools of if you are investing, how do you research an asset? So researching an asset is uh, first starting with understanding the business model itself. I'm not talking more on the business, but you can do the same thing on equity. You can do in on other investments, uh, even real estate or any other investments which we are. And in the episodes coming in, we will talk about different asset class, uh, which you can choose to invest. So first is a business model and business model can be further break into three parts. One, what I call master what matters, which is the micro economics of that business model. And that's very, very important to understand. You know, I'll tell you a story when one of the leading industrialists uh, uh, used to run a very large company. And I asked him this question uh, once, uh, you know, uh, that why don't you invest into stock? He had raised some money and the money was lying in the bank and he was, uh, you know, uh, lying idle at that time. It was just uh, because he just raised that money. And I gave him a suggestion that uh, uh, why don't you put the money because it's lying idle at this stage in some market and, and some returns can be expected. And markets were doing very well at that time. So he answered uh, to me that uh, uh, I have raised this money because I only invest into businesses I know best and I know my own business best and I will only invest in my business. So which is very important unless and until you know where you invest in. Uh, that's why people read these uh, and listen to these uh, masters who talk about markets and so on and so forth and they are never able to make the same kind of money that other people are making. Why they are not able to do that? Because they don't know about the business. They're just doing it because others are telling them to do. So unless and until you master uh, the business well, you, you understand where you, you are investing, you have actually gone through and mastered the microeconomics of that business, uh, it will be very difficult that you will be able to make gain out of that. Second, <clears throat> understand the growth, which we talked about earlier also, but growth, which is measurable, predictable, and sustainable. How your growth would be measurable, 
uh, predictable and sustainable. And that's very, very important. Sometimes you are in the growth, we, we clearly see a growth, but we are not able to put some predictability into that. And, and now these days, there is a bigger issue which is coming from a sustainability of businesses or a sustainability of enterprises. Uh, so you need to really define that growth uh, in different parameters and you can go as deep as possible. And third, you should do a very strong market analysis. Market analysis also is done on a macro analysis and a micro market analysis. Uh, because now these days, particularly in this COVID era, uh, we are generalizing situations. Delhi is very differently behaving today to what uh, Bihar is behaving. Right? So unless and until we understand which part of the world we are in, what is happening in our micro market, what is happening in a macro market. Macro market is allowed world economy, India economy, even a state economy. But uh, micro uh, markets is your own city or markets you want to operate and work on that. So fundamentally, first do your business model analysis. And that should come with a strong business intelligence. And that business intelligence should tell you that, is it worth looking at the category or looking at the asset or no? Second, what is influencing this business you're choosing or asset you're choosing, right? <clears throat> what are the influences around? And influences can be positive influences. It can be negative influences. It can be radical influences now these days. Even the consumer behavior can absolutely change, like retail. retail had a, a very radical change in the consumer behavior. Consumers started, uh, you know, asking more convenience and convenience came from home delivery and then the delivery company started coming in. A lot of people were eyes shut. They were not able to see that big consumer change happening. And always whenever you look at, especially in businesses or even in passive investment, so doing in, in terms of, uh, you know, stock market or the, in, the companies you're investing, continue to see the consumer insights. Uh, consumer insights are the largest uh, uh, behavior trend which would then impact the businesses. And if you are seeing a strong change in that happening and strong change in, in other markets you've seen, this would all happen here. So you need to really change your investment cycle and look at changes. And sometimes companies delay that understanding that. And if they delay that understanding, it can actually uh, uh, put, uh, you know, adversely affect the investor money. And uh, so you need to really see what is happening on the, on this uh, changes on the, in, at least in the consumer inside. Finally, understand the risk and risk, which means uh, what is the internal risk and what are the external risks and how you marry with reward. You know, I have been particularly in our business in franchising. Uh, we see a lot of uh, people who come and I even tell them very high risk uh, uh, situation, but they still go out and invest because they know the reward is equally high. There are investors who make their choices uh, because they understand and they're able to see that uh, sometimes they are on a high reward kind of a mindset. So they also don't mind taking high risk. Uh, so, but one has to really do this balance of risk and reward, especially if you are investing into a business, then the, uh, you need to really see what is the internal risks you are carrying. Uh, internal risk can be a lot of things now. These days, uh, businesses are very vulnerable and they have a lot of risk. They have security risk. They have our uh, data risk, they have uh, intellectual property risk, uh, they have uh, a lot of other risks. They have even internal team members who became their competition has a risk. Uh, similarly, you have external risk which comes from cost, uh, you know, your competition, your customer change, behavior change, a lot of risks are there in the, in the business. I personally feel that in last uh, 26, 27 years of uh, my running business, the last five, six years have changed drastically. Uh, I think, uh, risk is becoming a very strong part of your uh, planning structure. If you're not planning in depth, uh, you will not be able to do that. Now let's uh, go into uh, the stage where we need to really, uh, and once we have understood that uh, this is how the businesses and, and they would have their three things, as I said, and just be, uh, revise this situation. How do you research on an asset, research on asset, research on business model, research on uh, what is influencing and what is the risk on that. Now let's go into <clears throat> my uh, part on in terms of how do you evaluate a business uh, a decision or an or a investment decision. How do you evaluate uh, if you want to invest into a business? First, build a case. And case would be, again, what I call uh, O2C. You know, what means that anytime when you're making a decision to invest, you are extremely optimistic. Uh, when you are optimistic, uh, then you don't want to listen to a lot of things which are coming to you. You're rather adverse. You become a shield that you don't want to look at it. So unless and until you 
shift your mind from being optimistic to a critic uh, and continue to change the roles, uh, you will not be able to build a strong case of your investment. So first, try to do this, what I call O to C, uh, optimistic to a critic or vice versa. So you need to, while every investment you will do, you have to be extremely optimistic about the investment, but the best critic also comes inside you. So, which is telling you a lot of things, but we're not listening. So unless and until we build the case, we'll not be able to do that. Second, investment forecast. Cycle of reinvestment is very important. And I explain you later. Fundamentally, uh, unless you, sometimes we get into an investment and which we forecast the initial investment, but we don't know what is the cycle of investments coming for this. And that's something which you need to forecast. Uh, what would it need money after one year, two year, three year? Would you have to fuel it up? And what kind of cycle of investment is just coming in? Unless and until that is very defined, uh, don't uh, uh, make a decision on investment. Third is uh, making a full business plan and change cycle. You know, how the business is going to evolve. Businesses like humans, you know, so they keep evolving, right? So they have to breathe. They have to change. What is a change cycle? When do you think the changes have to become? What are these changes? Um, Four, you know, this is where... I have realized that most of the investments have uh, been, um, you know, not been so fruitful because people were either adequately, not adequately capitalized, they were undercapitalized and they did not the complete investment cycle. So they didn't do complete investment cycles so or businesses or, or the, even any investment you've done uh, was not doing this. You see a lot of projects uh, uh, in the real estate not being completed uh, because there was never a closure on the, on the, on the capital required. So a lot of people attempt the businesses. They feel that the market would be bullish and markets were not bullish. They were not able to complete the projects. And uh, hence, these investments are all wasted. And future people who invested with them has also wasted their investments or they would have to take a haircut. So capitalization is very, very important. You need to really define uh, the kind of monies which are required. And especially in these times, you will find only the fit companies would come out and all the other companies would not be able to do that. Fifth is your do your legal and commercial uh, due diligence in terms of if you're if you're getting into any uh, investment, it might be in a real estate or a financial investment or buying a business. You need to do a lot of uh, your legal study and legal advice, and then only make that. I think and finally present your investment case to what I call your personal advisor board. And the personal advisors are people who are not so influenced by you they can also come with their own viewpoint and that's why i call it a personal board sometimes you only go to your uh, absolute first family and they are normally think or are influenced by you and uh, so don't go to them go to your personal board and this should be credible people who you should present your business plan or you think that you are planning to invest in that and hear from them and and then only do that so i will repeat it for everybody build your case do your investment forecast, make a strong business plan with a change cycle, capitalization, legal and commercial advice, and also present it to your personal board. Now, <clears throat> let's go on a final topic for the day, uh, which is also when you think about uh, investment. First, as I said, do your uh, life and financial goal. Second, search an asset. Third is think also on exit, because exit is equally to be thought uh, when you are investing. I think it comes the same day when you think about invest, you also think about exit. And, uh, <clears throat> and I feel that the times have gone where people were invested for life in businesses or, or any other investment cases. You need to also think equally that when is exit going to be. And exit is always uh, in two, divided in two parts. One is what I call planned exit. And second is very opportunistic. So opportunist uh, and planned are two different things. They don't really come in and both can exist uh, parallelly with you. Uh, so planned is a when, uh, when should the planned exit done? Uh, most of the time I will tell you on a business cycle, business cycle has cycle where it kind of starts from what I call incubation and inception. Then it goes to growth stage then it goes to maturity stage. And at a maturity stage, I've seen businesses need to be recapitalized and they have to go up in the in the renewal stage, which means that they will have to renew themselves and go up. Now, like these days, uh, you see the auto companies. Auto companies are passing through a huge change cycle. Uh, most of these companies are facing multiple issues. They have decrease of uh, you know, uh, declining growth, and they have a lot of competition coming in. They have uh, issues on 
people switching into electrical, so needs a future capital to be deployed, and a lot of other disruptions are going on. And then you have economic disruption, then you have this lockdown, then you have production issues, and multiple other issues are coming in entirely. So all these companies which would have a chest or would have a lot of capital with them to bring this change for renewing this, and maybe look at a new industry which can come out of them, which is a new mobility which people would like to do, they would be only able to survive. A lot of them which would be already stretched or they would not be able to find either an exit or a recapitalization would not be able to do that. So, so when you come down to maturity level, you need to really ask, do you have that money uh, to re, re, uh, uh, you know, revise your company or reinvent your company or, or put it into renewal stage? If you don't have that at this stage, you need to really look at a planned exit. And that's something which we strongly advise. Don't wait, otherwise you'll get to a decline stage. And decline stage, a value erosion happens. You don't get the value and you will not be able to even sometimes get a right buyer at that time. So one of the areas which we strongly advise all our investors at uh, companies at Business uh, X is that when you come down to a point where you are absolutely at the top and you are mature, but you don't see your, your future going up, and you will not be able to reinvest in the business to get to the next level. You will not be able to change the orbit where you are. At that stage, it is best. A lot of Indian companies who found a good exit uh, were the companies which uh, uh, were companies which uh, were, say, largest in India, and they felt that there would be a time either they have to merge with them a global company, or they would have to have that money, enough money. Like Hero took a decision to part away from Hero Honda because they had all the capital to look at the next level of growth themselves. So they were able to go to Africa, other places in the world and compete with Hero uh, Honda in different ways. If they would have not got that money, they would have actually merged themselves back with the Honda itself. So see, this is a very careful decision. I think the best time to exit is the time where you are at the top. And if you feel that at this stage, you don't have ability to go to the next level or create a new orbit, uh, then you will have to find an exit structure. Or sometimes, uh, you know, people have to also find an exit where they feel that they, they don't have uh, the kind of resources, energy, and that is the best time they need to pass the baton to somebody else. Being opportunist, I think, is, is, is also not a bad thing because I feel that sometimes we shy away not to really talk about exit. We don't really talk to people around us. So if you are somebody who thinks that I, I need, you need to really look at an exit point, then you need to go and surround yourself with the investment ecosystem, how the investment ecosystem is. You need to really talk to you know, both uh, your strategic or a financial buyer, you know, because, uh, and also uh, one should understand in exits I've found, there are two types of buyer groups. One is very strategic, who come from your industry, they have ability to understand your business, and, uh, and can turn around that business. And most of the times, non-profit, uh, non-performing businesses would always attract a strategic buyer. Uh, financial buyers are purely, uh, they are return-based uh, investors, so are always looking at businesses which are largely performing, and they always give you a max value. So you need to really see where your business is and where your uh, asset is, and reach out to either a strategic or a financial buyer, and be very frank on that. You know, I'll give you an example. Uh, we run magazines. And uh, once I was traveling with somebody who was running a competing magazine with me, absolutely competing. And he started just competing with us. And uh, we met at the airport. And he said, why can't I come with, your, with you? With you going on the same side I'm going. And we'll talk on the So his car followed and he came in my car and we were talking. You will not believe in the first five minutes, he told me, would like to buy my magazine. And obviously, I was a competition to me, and I have no reason to buy his magazine. But I, I now think how straight he was in terms of taking decision. He knew that only person who can fix this because it was a franchise magazine uh, would have been me. Uh, so he offered me to do that. So this is how you should really talk about your exit. You should not shy away. You should really talk to anybody and even hire a banker or a professional service provider. Like the Business X also is an is a investment bank which works with helping people who are looking to exit. Now I'll leave you with uh, five things which I've learned in my 26 years of uh, uh, business career, uh, which is very important whenever you're looking at of investment. First is uh, timing of the idea. You know, anything which you invest, 
see the timing and anything which has worked for me is always got timing if i was my timing was right for that idea uh, i was very successful and that's something which is a starting point i have always seen you have, you are always a winner if you are a first mover in a business second find your own originality in investment uh, don't follow other to invest find your own originality why why you are original uh, you you are investing into this what you bringing into this and uh, how you want to treat this investment right so you have your own originality on that idea third uh, i always feel that everybody talks about diversify your investments put into multiple things i feel that uh, my own approach is a little different i say 70% put concentrated investment 70% of all put in concentrated in things which you you are deeply confident on and stay committed on that 70% on that and 30% maybe on a diversified approach right so i i don't want to see a complete diversified portfolio i see 70% concentrated and 30% diversified uh second you need to take care of your investment capital uh, would come later uh, sometime people like cap- just putting capital can take care of your investment no absolutely no you take care of your investment so fundamentally it is important that you are taking care there is as i start uh, started the the session with there is nothing like a passive you are an active investor uh, even if you are putting money in the stock market or a mutual fund or something you are taking care of your investment nobody else is taking care for you and finally fifth which i have now learned uh, earlier i was very different i will be honest uh, this is not something which was in first 10 years of my investment or even 20 years of my investment now i think similarly i feel the emotions can stay you know it's just a business or life so fundamentally sometimes you need to keep your emotions away and uh, not think sometimes we, we just marry them too much and it's just a business you know if it does well if it not done well you can just get uh, rid of it so fundamentally don't get emotional about your investments uh, wherever you invested if it is working for you very well continue bring the continuity in that and if it is not working out just find your exit and move out so this is something uh, in the first episode we'll talk about the next episode on scale up how do you scale uh, your investments or your businesses then we will take up a, how to build value and then we'll come back on investment and take one asset class and go deeper into that asset class understand uh, how to invest in that asset class and what are the risks and rewards on that asset class so any questions you want me to take sonali if you're there or uh, sure sir so thank you first of all thank you so much for such a wonderful session and for uh, sharing your valuable insights with all of us i'm sure it be, it is useful to all the attendees present out there so thank you so much and yeah we have a few questions lined up with us so uh, i would just start uh, with the first question so uh, it is from mr rahman choudhury and he says what are the investment opportunities in the new normal after covid-19 pandemic according to you so very difficult uh, question we are still in the discovery phase uh, mr rahman but i feel that uh, you know first i i don't i'm not liking this new normal thing you know so uh, i feel that the world is not changing it's it's going to be the same as it should be maybe slight of changes would happen in terms of the way we we, we behave uh, over next 5 to 6 months and then we'll come down to what we used to do always uh, maybe a behavioral change would happen yes markets would shrink that's for sure and uh, and this is a good time to plan and put any investment you want to do which industries all industries are good I, even i think a lot of people are talking about uh, gyms would not work or somebody is saying this would not work i i don't see that i i am maybe a foolish optimistic on this but i feel that world would not change we build this uh, you know hundreds of hundreds of years we have some civilization been built it's not going to change in just but yes uh, some business would be out of it and there would be an opportunity uh, for looking at those businesses i would say uh, some of the investments i would like to do in is more in technology a lot of hyper local edutech uh, so a lot of these uh, industries would anyway would have grown but now they have actually got a little bit of a spike in their uh, growth cycles uh, 
a lot of uh, uh, i would say renewable energy uh, you know uh, recycling waste management all these are very bullish uh, industries to me uh, but uh, otherwise you can you can just plan any industry i rather i would say even a lot of uh, you know looks like adversely impacted industries would also create a lot of opportunities uh, acquisition opportunities uh, in in those industries also and you will see now that you will see the bigger boys would start picking up you know the big hotel chains would start using this as an opportunity to pick up a lot of assets uh, at this stage because a lot of people think that hotels will not to run but that's not true uh, at this time i think even the the fitter businesses would acquire the not so fit businesses that could happen so otherwise i am i am bullish on on all the industries india if you do anything to do with consumption you cannot go wrong Uh, anything to do with consumption, uh, so because we have uh, uh, this population to our advantage in that sense. Any other question? Uh, great. Uh, so we have one more question from Miss Sonal Krishnatri, and she says, in this current scenario where we see liquidity and demand issues, we may see more sellers of their businesses, but less buyers or investors in the business. So are we prepared and have the adequate study and future plans to match the demand and supply of the business? of buyers and sellers very good questions uh, sonal i think uh, you were absolutely right uh, the sell side would increase and buy side would shy uh, while they were not going away they would shy making the decision or they would become uh, sometimes they they become a confused group they get too much on the plate and they they keep looking at multiple assets so uh, i think uh, yes you're right uh, and this scenario is uh, uh, very typical and uh, i feel that the sell side has certainly got a, a big you know uh, supply side which is means that a lot of uh, businesses would come in the market to sell and the buyers would not be so many at least in the short term which in 3 to 6 months but as the market's coming in you will see a lot of buyers coming in and uh, i also see uh, you know there is a, a uh, you know a good market in 2021 and the mna side i feel that uh, mna would boom in 2021 and a lot of uh, buyers would come back with confidence in the, in the business and try to commit to acquisition uh, the early signs would start coming in and uh, in this year in the next two quarters but the real uh, value would come in the 2021 uh, cycle uh, and i would say that uh, 2021 create a balance between uh, sell and buy side a uh, sell side would continue to be in in uh, in Uh, in there for next three to four years. Rather, I think we will see in the fourth quarter of uh, this financial year a uh, spike coming in the sell side. A lot of uh, businesses when they are closed, uh, global companies when they have closed their uh, financial year or the companies which would India would have to close in their next year financial year. So you will see a lot of uh, things happening on that time. <laughs> oh, wonderful, sir. So we'll just take up the last question uh, for the session. uh the question says if i don't have any savings can i take bank loans and invest in businesses would that be a good idea and if yes which bank provides loans without collaterals <laughs> no without collaterals yeah so first if you're starting a business and without uh, and taking a loan and and this are don't do it uh, you know india is not very suitable for business loans uh, and i i say this with with uh, uh, you know bring a partner with you share equity unlock an equity but don't take a loan especially when you start a small business because the cost of capital in india is ridiculous it's very high and if it is very high then you make money i don't want to take a loan and and the service loan would become a very big difficulty and apps and entrepreneurs suffering uh, when they take loans and this is a very and these bankers are bankers you know they would put everything on block and they would sign your personal guarantees and they run out of your homes and things like that so don't take a loan and and try to do that my advice would be uh, uh, at this stage uh, businesses you should do largely with your own capital it's a good time to get into business fantastic time to get into business you will get everything cheaper and uh, great deals are available both resale deals are also good available and uh, but try to be with your own capital maybe start small there is no 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 reason to attempt bigger businesses or a much larger businesses than borrow capital i don't think that should be done 
capital should be best and only borrowed when you have very clearly large projects and which has a, a cycle of investment and then you have to uh, debt is only and that also we have seen has not worked i mean you see infrastructure companies and a lot of other companies are suffering because of cost of capital but i certainly don't advise in india for small businesses to do that are we not japan we not us where the loans are cheaply available uh, while the government has always spoken about it but really on the ground we don't have that uh, you know so the cheap loans are not available and some grants came in in between there were some mudra uh, finance and couple of other finances available from msme also available if you get that that's okay and there was also uh, there is a uh, you know startup uh, india registration which you do and then you give you small fund which is uh, you know is very small interest rates are, or things of that nature then it's fine you know uh, uh, then you can borrow that kind of money and uh, but uh, otherwise don't go to a bank loan and never ever try to do a personal loan and start a business never it's a, it's shooting yourself in the feet right right uh, so i think we'll just wrap up the q and a round with this uh, thank you so much once again uh, gorav sir thank you for a wonderful session and thank you to all our attendees for being part of this session uh, anything else you would like to say so no thank you very much uh, thank you kind of you to invite me and uh, uh, we are uh, business x is as i said is a investment platform where we help uh, companies uh, investors to invest into startups they they want to look at joint ventures if they're looking for fractional ownership or they're looking at even buying existing businesses all that is a is a work of business and there are hundreds and hundreds of opportunities listed on that so you can visit that and choose the right opportunity thank you very much thank you for your time and see you next week uh, same at 3 o'clock saturday for the next session thank you very much thank you so much uh, gorav sir thank you to all our attendees as sir said we'll see you next week next saturday at the same time with another session on all about scaling up so yeah thank you so much for your time and if you have any questions any queries at all please feel free to get in touch with me uh, i'll be very happy to clear any doubts that you might have and we'll see you the next time thank you so much Thank you.